Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. XTNA star Christian Cage debuts in AEW. XTNA star Ethan Page also debuts in AEW. And one of the most emotional wrestling angles of the year main evented the show to just kind of fizzle out. I'm Mr. Davis, asking you to please give us a subscribe, super kick that thumbs up button, and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news and review videos. Like my review of AEW Revolution 2021, in about 10 minutes. In a match that had house show written all over it, and I am here for that, the only pre-show bout saw Rio and Thunder Rosa team against Dr. Britt Baker and their injured rubber replacing cutest wrestler in the world, Maki Ito, who came out singing her entrance theme, which is also the song to every anime you've ever seen. Nikoni Kuni? Kawaii. 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 The action was quite sloppy in parts, but the charisma in the ring more than made up for the blanks. Everyone's characters meshed well together, while Rosa also furthered her feud with Brit, getting hit by Reba with the crutch behind the referee's back to lose. A literal booking crutch. And if I wasn't clear, Maki Ito is the cutest wrestler in the world. The main show super kicked right off, with the Young Bucks attacking MJF and Chris Jericho in their Blood Feud tag title match. This might not have been as great as the Bucks' outings with Paige and Omega or FTR last year, but they still never disappoint. The final third in particular was full of great near falls. Jericho hitting a Judas effect on Wardlow. It's Judas mistaken. The Bucks referencing Impact Team, the Motor City Machine Guns, and then having a super kick party. First big show, now, even leg slaps have left WWE for AEW. Leg slaps to AEW confirmed. Jericho ended up taking the pin, giving MJF the perfect example to say to the rest of the inner circle, Chris hasn't got it anymore. Jericho later announced Wednesday's Dynamite will have a war council to shake up the faction. Battle Royals in AEW have been a mixed affair, but this was easily the best one that they've ever done and actually, my favourite match on the whole show. It was essentially the Royal Rumble for tag teams, with a new team coming out every 90 seconds and the eliminations when both members are out. There were cool storyline progressing angles like QT Marshall falling out with Dustin Rhodes and then eliminating himself, potentially foreshadowing the Natural Nightmares split. Bear Country doing some amazing power spots. The Butcher was the Butcher. Oh, Butcher. And just when you think, man, this is a really fun match with loads of great tag teams, that's all of them, right? Out comes Death Triangle. And then out comes John Silver and Alex Reynolds. The final four came down to a mouth-watering clash of Jungle Boy and John Silver joining forces against Pac and Ray Phoenix, which ended up as Phoenix versus Jungle Boy, where Ray is so good, even if you think he gets eliminated, he still somehow glitches back into the ring to win. An incredible match, which sets up a Death Triangle versus Young Bucks feud, oh dear god. In a totally different kind of match, Shida and Mizunami had a hard-hitting Japanese strong style, no I won't sell your German suplex clash. Even though they did about two kickouts too many, the final sequence was absolutely absolutely incredible, which Shida won with a spinning knee in my second favourite match of the night. Shida worked slightly more heel, including an overtly cheating eye poke, but then helped Mizunami after the match when Nyla Rose Baker and Ito attacked them. Rosa ran down to even the odds, setting up a six-woman tag for Dynamite. I'm seeing double here! Twelve women in an AEW storyline. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Chris, the Cypriot Sensation Patru, and Luke's favourite fan, the one, the only, the awesome Bubba. Mero and Kip Sabian attacked Chucky T and Orange Cassidy backstage, prompting a more drawn out angle than a match. That angle being, Miro's going to kill you all now. This was the best Miro has looked since his AEW debut, and was the Bulgarian brute prime we all wanted him to become once he left WWE, not Kip Sabian's gamer buddy. He smashed Chucky's head through a window, beat up Cassidy, and even threw Penelope Ford to the ground. He shouted at Kip for checking on his wife instead of focusing on the match, 
priorities, man. And then won by tapping out Chucky in the game over. Make this man a single star now. I thought Paige versus Hardy was the best told storyline in the whole company up until the go home show let off a lot of the feud steam. They had a 15 minute match based around Paige's injured hand, where the Dark Order sweetly saved Hangman from private party interference to win. Paige hugged and celebrated with the Dark Order afterwards, please be their leader now. We then got the face of the revolution ladder match between Cody Rhodes, Scorpio Sky, Pentagon, Lance Archer, Max Caster and the AEW debuting Ethan Page, where the winner would get a shot at the TNT title on Wednesday's Dynamite, symbolised by the giant gold ring suspended above them from Sonic. The win at the next pay-per-view by being the first down a giant green pipe. This was as insane as you would expect, with Penta hitting a Canadian destroyer on a ladder bridge on Cody, Sky went through a ladder on the outside, Penta super kicked Jake the Snake Roberts so hard it made him really bloated on the apron. Let Lance, man. Lance, I've had too many pies. And a huge blackout from Archer on Caster onto a ladder. But the real star of the match was the giant gold hoop. Apparently, it was meant to be a brass ring, a la the ones people never quite reach in WWE. But it definitely looked more like a giant Cheerio. Or as one person said in our live reactions chat, a golden hemorrhoid pillow. Sky knocked off Cody to win, meaning I will be the number one contender to the championship at Fastlane. Then I can win and main event wrestle Jamia against Andy and Adam. Oh, the pals in my hair. Pals in my hair. Then it was time for the main reason many appeared to have bought the pay-per-view. The big tease of the Hall of Fame worthy signing. Who is it? Who is it that? Oh, it's Christian Cage. There's my Pete. He of edging Christian fame. The guy who only made his in-ring return for WWE in January's Royal Rumble after seven years out. He signed the contract, left it in the ring, and debuted his new catchphrase, out work everyone. And it sure did work a few people. Even though what AEW teased is true, Christian is definitely a Hall of Fame worthy talent. The hype did get out of control because, well, CM Punk to AEW confirmed. We saw a portion of our live reaction viewers vocally underwhelmed by the announcement. Me, I guess? Well, I'm not overwhelmed, I'm not underwhelmed, I'm I'm just whelmed. It's what I realistically expected, thinking it'd either be Christian or Kurt Angle. And with Edge being such a prominent figure in WWE right now, it does make AEW look like the knockoff promotion. But what is definitely for certain, WWE dropped the ball big time here. They knew Christian was cleared to return months before the Rumble. They had big money reunion matches like Edge and Christian versus the Usos and Roman Reigns sitting on the table. Yet they didn't sign him. It's just the latest instance of WWE undervaluing Christian throughout his career. He deserves better and he's going to be a very valuable asset in experience and mainstream name value to help grow AEW's roster and brand. So what happened? Tony Khan said on the post pay-per-view media call that he's been friends with Christian since they met seven years ago, and that he thinks he's one of the great wrestlers from the last couple of decades. Khan also revealed it was actually Christian who called him and asked to wrestle in AEW, implying WWE had nothing for one of their biggest Royal Rumble surprise returns. Just like Carlito, who left two weeks later. Additionally, Paul White revealed on the same call that Vince McMahon rang him to wish him well when his AEW signing was announced. And there's no anger, there's no dirt between him and WWE. Major backstage heat between WWE and Big Show confirmed. Team Taz's Brian Cage and Ricky Starks then took on Darby Allen and Sting in a cinematic street fight match. Where Sting didn't just awesomely wear Darby face paint, so did a bunch of people wearing Sting masks. Oh my god. Retribution to AW confirmed. This was a thing, like a scene halfway through a straight to DVD action film. Not the final scene, but the one where they beat up a bunch of guys in an abandoned warehouse somewhere to find something before they take on the end boss, maybe to save the lady or whatever. It's as good as cinematic matches are going to get. I'm just a bit over them now. 
Darby Coffin dropped Cage through a floor of the building and Sting pinned Ricky Starks, leaving the main event to be, of course, the exploding barbed wire deathmatch, where three sides of the ring were surrounded by barbed wire and C4, and at the end of the 30 minute counter, all the explosives would go off, which referee Bryce Remsburg is preparing for by getting ready for a spot of beekeeping. This match was an absolute spectacle, racked with tension because one wrong move could literally blow up in your face. Mox got the first two explosions and bled a gusher from his forehead, hit a paradigm shift on the exploding board outside, and had one of the best spots of the year, kicking the bottom rope to trigger an explosion after Kenny pinned him from the one-winged angel. Not technically kicking out and protecting the finisher. Omega's gimmick is all about the heel interference though, and the Good Brothers helped him beat down Mox with an exploding barbed wire bat. Then a another one-winged angel onto a chair to win. It was an awe-inspiring bout, pushing the limits of the modern day art form, but there was still the small matter of all the bombs still counting down around the ring. The heels handcuffed Mox, intent on blowing him up. When his former friend turned enemy turned friend again, Eddie Kingston ran out for the save. But he couldn't pick up the dead weight, so he just lay on top of John to protect him as the timer counted down, heroically sacrificing himself for his fallen brother. I genuinely teared up and recapping it to my girlfriend this morning, I legit cried again. I was very tired. It was one of the most emotionally investing angles I've ever seen. But then the explosions didn't really go off. They just fizzled like Gilberg's entrance. Presumably not knowing how bad it looked, Mox and Kingston still sold it like they were dead, which just made them look even worse. The lack of spectacular explosions here completely undermined Eddie's sacrifice. Guys, your weekly show is literally called Dynamite! It could have worked if Kenny then revealed it was all a joke, like the little flag that says bang out of a toy gun, but it appears AEW didn't have a plan B when they really really should have. This type of angle has a very high probability of going wrong, and it did. Yet AEW didn't have anything in preparation for that. So now any detractors like Jim Cornette have the perfect ammunition to tear AEW to shreds, and it's tough for fans like us to defend it. Even Moxley himself thought that angle was rubbish, telling the crowd after the show, Kenny Omega may be a tough son of a bitch, but he can't make an exploding ring worth an S word. An idea Khan repeated in the post-show Cool, blaming Kenny for building a dud. So in storyline at least, this is Omega's fault. What do you think of Revolution? Let me know in the comments down below and vote in our poll on a poll match on the community tab where 61% of you did indeed vote for Turnbuckle Sparklers. AEW put on another fantastic show with spectacular spots, newsworthy debuts with Christian, Ethan Page and Makiito, and ultimately fantastic in-ring wrestling, but it's how you leave them, folks, and they botched the landing with the final explosion. Revolution 2021, such a shame, is a four out of five. Luke and I will have a full podcast live stream review on our Wrestle Talk podcast channel, so go over there and subscribe. And in the meantime, watch Adam Blompier's latest list on parts for known. Here's a look. Everybody wants to win a match. But in pro wrestling, you can't always win a match But sometimes accidents, they happen just like that And then the wrong wrestler can win a match A square with- okay, enough of that God, isn't live entertainment fun? Just about anything that can go wrong will go wrong And in pro wrestling, sometimes that includes the wrong person winning an entire match Whoopsie See, professional wrestling referees, in order to avoid bum-clenchingly awful moments Like, say, Earl Hebner stopping his own count at No Way Out 2001 Because he forgot it was the finish, oh no, it's so awful Referees are instructed to call the match like it's a shoot Meaning if a wrestler forgets to kick out or something else goes wrong, tough turds Cowboy, you done just lost yourself a wrestling match. And honestly, somehow it's happened more often than you'd think. Here are 10 wrestlers who accidentally won wrestling matches. Watch 10 wrestlers who accidentally won a match by clicking the video on the right and subscribe to Parts for Known for all of Adam's lists. And click the video below that for mine and Luke's full AEW Revolution podcast review. I've been Mr. Davis, your number one contender. Jam that jam.